Thank you. I'll call the meeting to order City of University Heights City Council meeting. Today is March 14, 2023, and the meeting is being conducted electronically. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, with roll call, uh, four council are here. Bobby Scott won't be here tonight. He has a family commitment. And um, so we have approval of three minutes. Um, and I'm gonna just ask generally, and then if there's any additions, I'll break it down. But um, is I'm, I'm gonna ask approval for February 14th, February 21st, and March 7th. Are there any additions or corrections to any of those minutes? Hearing none, the minutes are approved by unanimous consent. Public input. Now I hear there's no public present tonight. No. So if anybody arrives, we'll let them speak if they want. So then we'll go to mayor's report. Uh, so the first thing I wanna talk about is save a meeting date for our calendars of either April 18th or April 25th to have the last final budget meeting. Um, what would, are there suggestions? The date. Would April 25th give us more time to do the publication and take care of all that, please? I think that'd be good, but how's that work with everyone? The 25th, Tuesday, the 25th of April. This would be probably a 15, 20 minute meeting, depending on if public are there to speak. Sounds good for everybody. Okay, we'll say uh, April 25th and I'll give that message to Steve Cool and Steve uh, Ballard will have a resolution for our March 28th meeting when we're gonna talk about the budget. Uh, so, Back to the agenda. Okay, so in my report, I talked about um, um, the latest of what's going on with the school board and the county and the cities. Uh, are there any questions for me? Okay, I'll, I'll bring back information at our next meeting on the 28th. So legal reports, Steve didn't have a this month are there any questions for steve steve did you want to say anything no thanks no okay very good we'll go on to city clerk report that was uh put in our packets um mike did you want to yeah make any additional I, comments? I, I thought i had sent it on Saturday with the minutes, but I guess with three sets of minutes, I was I, I overlooked including my report. Um, the report itself was pretty scant. The one thing I would say in the last two weeks, we've had three public information requests, um, which were all pretty easy to fill. One was um, all of the building permits that we'd issued this year. So I sent them the one permit. We've sent off uh, a listing of the salaries of all city employees for 2022, which is something we have to publish in the paper every year anyway, and that published today. So I sent them that. And the third request was, I can't remember now, but it was also something pretty easy to find. So that's, we hadn't had any public information requests in quite a while. And but, they weren't anybody from the city, right? No, I mean, no, they uh, one is uh, open the books, which is all about transparency. And since Iowa has pretty good open records laws anyway, I mean, it was very easy to do that. The other one is some the building permit was somebody in Florida and it looks like it's a national council for something or other. So, no, nothing, nothing local. But that's all I have. Okay, any questions for Mike? Okay, we'll go on to the city treasurer report. Lori sent that today with a list of warrants. And John is here too. Oh, hi, John. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, so Lori, Lori and you are gonna be getting together here soon, but she went ahead with this month. And uh, so, 
uh, there's a list of warrants. Are there any additions to the warrants? No, the, we had nothing that came in today, so. Okay. Uh, is there any objection to uh, paying the bills? Hearing none, the warrants will be paid by unanimous consent. Okay, so we'll go down to um, community protection and Troy sent his report today. Uh, are there any questions for Chief? Do you have any additional comments, Chief? Yeah, I'd like to comment on uh, a couple items. One, I'd like to point out that the work on the traffic control signals has been completed and invoiced. Uh, again, as, as per prior agreement, University of Iowa is going to pay for the upgrade to Melrose and Sunset. I just need to invoice them. And then I'd like to touch on item F, uh, just as a brief recap. When I came back from the last uh, Police Chief Association training conference, I brought back some information on automated enforcement. First of all, can you guys hear me? I think I might have a laggy connection. We can hear you. Uh, some automated traffic enforcement and how that might address some of the continued community concerns about, about speeds on our streets. Uh, the mayor, I believe, but directed Councillor Scott, uh, Councillor Gaughan and I to uh, look into it a little further and gather some information. I have done that, uh, just kind of very, very coarse numbers. Roughly, I mean, daily traffic counts on Melrose Avenue. Average to daily counts on Melrose Avenue are in excess of 13,000 vehicles traveling down Melrose Avenue every day. Uh, the last traffic study we had done and happened to be on Coase or not on, not on Melrose showed that not quite 15% of the vehicles, but but just under 15% of the vehicles traveling down Coser were at 10 miles an hour and over. I don't know if that will transfer directly to Melrose or not, but the community, there were some community voices that were concerned that that meant that, again, 15% of the vehicles were traveling over the speed limit and some vehicles, some smaller percentage were traveling significantly over the speed limit. Uh, as all of you between in your various careers know, you can't, throw all of your forces at a very small percentage of the problem. You need to make sure that you are servicing all your community and all your community's needs. Uh, and, and in part, that's why the discussion about automatic traffic enforcement came about. In Iowa, those systems, uh, at least with the vendor that I spoke with, those systems are all the upfront costs are paid by the vendor if the council would decide to at some point go through with it. The maintenance costs are paid by the vendor. The city sets fines. There are, and I have examples of other Iowa communities as far as ordinances, uh, policy, administration, uh, but there is no, I mean, just looking at the goal is to reduce speeds and make the road safer. And I have, I'm confident that that actually happens, but you have to look at what the additional costs are, both financial and manpower costs and what the potential unforeseen consequences are. So anyway, we have gathered a lot of information on that. It's still very preliminary, uh, but it is generally all positive as the result of one of the two meetings that uh, Stephanie and Bobby and I had. I think it was Bobby uh, asked about what the local MPO's position was on, on automated traffic enforcement on ATEs. I had not thought to to contact uh, the MPO. So I did so, I spoke with the executive director, Kent Ralston, and, and I'm, I'm not quoting him directly, but I'm being accurate when I said the, he told me the MPO itself has no official position on the use of ATE. Uh, he said that personally, he thought they were a, a very useful tool and that it was particularly suited to a community such as University Heights. Uh, some of the reasons that we discussed was that unlike, unlike Iowa City, for example, where if you put up ATEs on a particularly problem arterial street that you had difficulty doing enforcement and traffic studies showed that there were, was a problem with speeders, that while that might lower speeds and it might address the issue to some degree, it would also displace the issue potentially 
one or two blocks to one side of that arterial street and create another unintended arterial street through a different neighborhood. Uh, University Heights does not have those same issues as Melrose is the east-west thoroughfare and Sunset is the north-south thoroughfare. And to a lesser degree, we have George Street and Kozer. Uh, so I was, it was very enlightening and, and informative talking and talking to Kent. And, and again, he, the MPO had no official position, but he felt strongly and voiced strongly that it was a useful tool and particularly suited to us. Uh, so that's the, the research that I've done and, and just some very, very crude numbers. I've pulled things from the state of Iowa. Uh, the last study I was able to pull, this was agencies or communities that had self-reported. And again, the goal is to lower speeds and make, make lower speeds, lower the number of motor vehicle accidents, which frankly, we don't have a lot, uh, but we do have a community concern about speeds. That is addressed through civil fines, not criminal fines. It does not directly impact one's driving record or even insurance unless those fines go unpaid. Uh, fines are set by the community and often mirror state fines for those same, for example, speeding violations or stop sign or stoplight violations, uh, just civil fines. They don't add the core costs and the, and the associated fees. Um, base fines tend to be $75 to $100. Uh, I mean, I, again, I can't guarantee anything, but I think it's unrealistic not to look at the whole impact of, of a system such as this. Our financial outweigh, if the community decided to move forward, that this would be nothing. The company would come in and install the cameras. The company would help us, would help me, and I, I work with uh, Councillor Moore as far as putting out uh, media notice and posting it to our web page to make sure that, that the community and our visitors were aware if we chose to move forward with this. Uh, we would, I mean, the industry standard is to run, when you go online with a system such as this, that you do it for a month's time. And during that month's time, only educational or warning notices are sent out. There are no fines that go out. Again, the goal is not for it to be a gotcha moment. The goal is certainly not to generate revenue. The goal is to reduce speeds and safer. There is a revenue aspect to it, though, and it's unrealistic not to consider that. Uh, just, again, very, very crude numbers. If there are 13,000 cars a day that travel down Melrose, and those are annual or uh, daily averages, you know, that's 4,700,000 cars a year. If 15% are speeding or committing violations, when I spoke with the, the vendor, with like when I spoke with Dorian, who was the representative of the company uh, that I chatted with, he said, during that warning period, you typically see a 50% or often see a 50% reduction in violations. So that would take it down to approximately 7% of the motorists ignored the signage, ignored, ignored the ATE and continued to speed. Even if you took that down, even if we had a hugely successful program and it, it succeeded in reducing speeds, uh, I, I, I failed to mention when I talked to the company, I said, you know, I want to make sure we had very clear signage. I like our flashing radar signs. I would want to make sure that, again, it should not be a gotcha moment. It should be to reduce speeds. Uh, Dorian said, well, this company does not provide devices such as that. They have another company they work with. And his company would pay for the purchase and installation of any electronic warning signs that we wanted in addition to the state required warning signs. So if you take 4.745 million motorists a year and you times that times, let's say 1% of them are violators, that's 47,450 violators a year. And again, just for the sake of this hypothetical discussion, if the base fine, the base civil fine, for example, was set at $75, uh, excuse me, I accidentally cleared my calculator, times those 47450. 
then that generates uh, gross revenue, a gross fine revenue of three and a half million dollars in the state of Iowa. The vendor, that's where they recover their fees for, for setting up the system and for the ongoing maintenance and administration of the system. They earn 35% of any fines that we send out. So that would leave 65% for the community to reinvest into its infrastructure or its enforcement efforts, or frankly, however the community would want to. Just those very crude numbers comes out to be a little over $2 million a year if that's 1% of the vehicles that travel down Melrose continue to do so in, in violation of our laws and violation of our signage and in and, and disregard of our efforts to keep our, our community roads safe. So I throw that out there because again, the goal is to reduce speeds. The goal is to address people that I've dealt with since I came here in 2019, you know, community members such as Mike Gay or Warren or, or many others that I've spoke with that continue to voice concerns about excessive speed in University Heights. <laughs> From a law enforcement perspective, one of the additional things that I like about this type of enforcement is eliminates any sort of feedback from increased manual enforcement, increased officer enforcement that, you know, the officers are only picking on me out of state plate. So the officers are only picking on me because I drive a muscle car or the officers are only picking on me because I'm, you know, name your minority, whatever the reason is, it eliminates that because the officers aren't picking on anybody. The community's not picking on anybody. The government's not picking on anybody. It would be well signed. There would be warning notices, uh, mail. I mean, if we, if we were to pursue this and we had no violations issued because everybody came into compliance, I think that would be fantastic. I just think it's naive to think that is what will happen. And again, we want to consider all the impacts, both negative and positive. So that in a nutshell is some of the information we gathered. There's much more to it than that. I'd be glad to speak with you all, whether you have questions now or whether you have individual questions. Uh, Bobby was not able to meet with that. We spoke with the company representative, but at this point, I or we just need some direction as far as, yes, please continue to gather information, or we would like to look at this in the near future or in the next fiscal year after we completed budget. I, I just, I don't want to be throwing a lot of man hours into it if this isn't something that you wish to pursue. But from my perspective, it has many, many benefits and, and, and frankly, few downsides. Uh, like I said, I was very encouraged and, and uh, I was Kent Ralston. I, I have a lot of respect for Kent. I've worked with him for many, many years in both this position and the last position. And I, I consider him the resident expert on all things traffic related. And he had, he was very encouraging about how it could be a useful tool for our community to address chronic issues. And I'm, I'll stop because I think I've gone on for about 10 minutes already. Uh, Any comments? If, if I can ask you. A question, uh, Chief. Um, yes. Over a 12 month period, how many accidents would you say we've had on Melrose? Do we have very many? No, we do not. And many of them are weather related and they're, they're relatively minor ones. And the other ones, frankly, are distracted drivers. I could run those numbers for you, Doug, but it, it is. Okay. If uh, I would guess, I would guess speculate a dozen and a half. Perhaps. Okay. Well, the one thing that appeals to me about the ATE is it frees up our officers to take care of the side streets that our residents are wanting enforcement on. So I really like the thought of that, that instead of being, you know, monitoring Melrose all the time, now you can move over to the arterial in case, you know, we do have crafty people that try to do shortcut through neighborhoods. That's where I guess I'd like to see our officers focus on is you know, that, that's fine. You think you can go around it, but we're going to be waiting for you. So I, I, that really appeals to me. And I think that's what our residents are looking for is more 
uh, community policing, and this will free you guys up. So like you say, we only got one or two guys on shift, you know, you, you can't be everywhere at the same time. I think this will free up, you know, to put them in problem areas like on residential streets that they shouldn't be speeding. So I, I'm, I'm all in favor of moving forward with this at our earliest convenience, uh, depending on uh, what the rest of the council and the mayor has to say. And, and towards some of your comments, uh, as far as where I use Melrose as an example, because I'm just pulling the available statistics, uh, we would decide and, and the company would work with us to decide where our problem areas were, whether that was accident driven or it was violation driven. Um, we would decide where we wanted to place the cameras. The, this particular ATE system has the ability to monitor, for instance, stop sign violations at, again, Kozer and George is typically where I receive the most complaints about stop sign violations. Uh, the system also integrates with handheld radar enforcement uh, mm -hmm. devices. So an officer can use that, the handheld device you program in where you are, it records that information, it records the the posted speed limits. I mean, that's all stuff that you input. And then it acts like, like a, a permanently mounted uh, ATE. It's just in the officer's hand for that specific location. So it does has that, it does have that mobile aspect. And you aren't tied to, you know, one particular ATE on one particular pole on Melrose or Coser or, or anything. It does have that flexibility and it does enable enable you to address right. And, and you can traffic. obviously tell they, they work because if you've ever driven to Cedar Rapids on the north end of the S curve, boy, it's funny how many brake lights come on. So obviously the people know. And, and as long as it's posted like they have in Cedar Rapids, you know, cameras enforced, yada, yada, yada. That way the driver has the choice of, I, I chose the consequences to go with it. It kind of takes the, the, the bad feelings off of us because you know, we didn't make you speed, you were well informed. So you made a choice to obviously speed. So you have nobody to be mad at but yourself. And I kind of like that to where we're not the villains, you know, that uh, it kind of puts the monkey on their back instead of ours. And I, I couldn't agree with you anymore. I mean, I, I think that it should be well signed. I think that we should go beyond what the minimum state requirements are on signing if we pursue this. I like the idea of installing the additional, like what we have on the west end of Melrose, the flashing radar signs, especially since the company is willing to contract with another vendor and pay for the purchase and installation of those signs. The problem with flashing signs typically is while they have immediate effect, that impact wears off in a relatively short period of time. It starts to wane after about two weeks by the traffic studies that I have looked at. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are no consequences. Uh, you know, there are no consistent and there certainly is no immediate consequences. This, on the other hand, there would be very consistent consequences. They would be colorblind consequences. They would be swift. And, uh, you know, I, I would treat them like traffic tickets, frankly. If somebody came in and had an excuse, I, I would be willing to consider that. And the goal should be compliance, not re generating revenue. So I'd be willing to say, look, totally get it. I appreciate it. Now you know I will avoid this ticket, but don't let it happen again because the next ticket will not be voided. Well, you know you're going to get doctors and nurses that claim to have an emergency going to the hospital. So, I, I, unfortunately, that's that's going to be the first excuse is they had a and, surgery they're late for. I mean, good luck with that. And we have that already. Yet we're delaying them to their potential emergency by by you know, stopping the break minutes on the side of the road. Well, you know what, if this is a true emergency, then go ahead and go to it. And you and I can chat afterwards when you receive your notice. And if it was, again, I, I the goal is voluntary compliance to make the city safer, not to jeopardize anybody's safety. And I, there, I see very, very little downside to it. But you all deal with the political side of it far more than I do. <laughs> well, I, I guarantee that nobody's going to come in four or five times a week saying, "Yeah, I was in an emergency surgery." I mean, after a while, they're going to they're going to wave the flag and give up. You know, 
it, that's what I wanted to do is go the speed limit or relatively close to it. Could you talk about when we were talking about this a little bit, you talked about the the ATEs in Cedar Rapids and they had to turn them off for a while. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, it was absolutely. interesting to me. Absolutely. Every year there is, or it seems like every year there is discussion with this at the state level and whether to modify uh, the existing laws that allow the use of ATEs or even to, to ban the use of ATE. And there was a time not all that long ago that ATE use in all of Iowa was suspended. Cedar Rapids shut down their system but they didn't shut off their system and they just weren't issuing, they weren't sending out notices anymore. They weren't, they weren't issue, issuing any civil fines. The system continued to run. The system continued to frankly act as a traffic counter and a traffic monitor. And I don't have those stats in front of me, but speeds went up significantly. I mean, almost overnight, as soon as the media put out a story that the system was off, uh, speeds immediately increased. I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna say it became a, a NASCAR super speedway, but speeds in, immediately increased, which to me goes to the point that Doug brought up. You see brake lights, you might be passed by somebody going 12 miles an hour over the speed limit or 20 miles an hour over the speed limit. But when they hit the north of that S-curve there and they see those flags and the sign that says photo enforced, and especially anybody that drives that sort of section of road with any regularity, they slow down to about eight over because Cedar Rapids sets theirs at just above that. And I don't want to say what everybody said, say to everybody what they set it up, but I think everybody knows. So they are, I mean, to me, that shows just how effective they are at gaining compliance with posted speed limits. And posted speed limits are not arbitrary. Josiah or Kent Ralston can speak to, to why they're set, you know, what's acceptable for a residential community. Melrose Avenue through University Heights is significantly different in nature than Melrose Avenue between Emerald Street and 218, where it's four lanes. And yes, there are some backyards that back up to it along one side but you don't have your kids playing out your front yard, playing out your front yard. You don't have the sidewalk actually in some places running right next to the curb like it does in University Heights. 13,000 vehicles traveling down. It's an arterial street for us, but it is right through our neighborhoods. I mean, I, it's a speed limit of 25 is very reasonable and it's supported by best practice on, on current traffic engineering. and, and there's a reason for it being 25. It's, it's a safe number. It gives motorists the ability to see and react when, you know, somebody's dog runs out into the street or worse yet, somebody's child runs out into the street. Any other comments? Um, we need to give, uh, the council needs to give him some direction. Uh, Stephanie, being on the committee, you and Bobby, um, what are your thoughts? I uh, I honestly don't see any negative impacts to this either. Um, I think it's going to be nothing but a positive thing. Um, why not have the safest community around and uh, be on the cutting edge if Iowa City hasn't even done this yet let's let's show them what what it can do for us and show them what by the numbers um you know after everything has been taken into account I can't wait to find out if it really truly does make us safer in all aspects and um I think it's just a no-brainer I think we move it forward and um I'm I'm curious as to what the rest of the council thinks as well. You saying you want to go first? Yeah, Tim. 
Dark well, I support it. I'm, but did you have comments, Lisa? No, I su I support it. Um, I'd be interested to know where you would put these. Definitely, I have some suggestions. Yeah, that's my question. Is I assume you to avoid the shortcutting, you might even do it on George and Kozer as well, as opposed to limiting it to the Sunset and um, Melrose? And I didn't get into specifics. Uh, there would be some sort of an assessment, which however we proceeded uh, with traffic counts and, and our real and perceived issues. But yes, our arterial streets through University Heights are Sunset and Melrose. Uh, George itself through University Heights it's less about speed and more about the stop signs. So I specifically ask about the ability to address stop sign violations in this particular system. The one of three vendors that I spoke with that followed through has that ability. And then as most of you are aware, if not all of you are aware, the section of Coser, particularly between George and Melrose, uh, we also receive uh, a fair amount of complaints as we do on Lisa section of codes are also uh, probably more so there, at least the recent ones I've, I've dealt with have to do with failure to come to a complete stop at that stop sign. So all of those are community concerns. They could be addressed by, by this ATE, uh, as I've learned in my discussions with the vendor. And then additionally, there would be that portable aspect. So, uh, for example, Kozer west of Sunset, if there was a perception that in the morning and afternoon, the traffic was flying down there to get to and from Horn Elementary, well, even though traffic count might not justify putting up an ATE there, it would be easy to deploy an officer with a sort of handheld device. Our current cars, frankly, aren't set up very well, don't have the flexibility to, unless they're sitting on the street like they're on, on Melrose, to do that sort of targeted enforcement, this system would allow it. I hear uh, council wants to move forward with looking, have you checking out more things and bringing back more information? And maybe we'll hear more from the public too about this. So I think, you know, you should go ahead and keep researching on it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Uh, we'll go to um, finance and Bobby uh, will be very busy. Uh, Steve Cool's going to get uh, the budget pretty well finished the end of this week, beginning of next week, and then we'll review it on March 28th. Um, any questions about that? So then we'll go to the engineer's report and Josiah and Ryan, you put out a report. It's just Josiah is here. You wanna go ahead, Josiah? I'm ready, can you guys hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, let's see, let me pull up my notes here. So we, have an, we do have an action item tonight. We have uh, resolution number 2308, accepting quotation for the 2023 street sweeping work. Uh, we obtained a quote from Streb Construction Company in a, at an hourly rate of $225 an hour. Uh, Streb has done it the last two years. Um, as far as I know, we've had uh, good quality of sweeping work. Um, that, that rate and the time it usually takes them would be well within the, the budgeted amount in the current fiscal year budget. Uh, so based on that price and based on their past performance, um, we would recommend accepting that quote for that work. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So consideration of resolution 2308 is before the council. Is there a motion? A motion. Okay, we'll go with Doug and then a second by Lisa uh, to uh, approve a uh, quotation for, for the um, quote for the 2023 20, street sweeping.
project. Um, roll call vote. Gone. Aye. Moore. Aye. Schroeder. Aye. Scott absent. Swales. Aye. Motion carries 4-0 with one absent. Thank you. Go ahead, Josiah. Um, sorry, I joined late. Had a problem getting into Zoom tonight, so I don't know. Uh, have you been through um, uh, the treasurer's report? Yes. Did you want to add something? I mean, we can, uh, we. Yeah. Oh, you wrote that in your report, didn't you? That extra. Yeah. So we had, um, I was just okay. checking the, I was just checking the warrants. So I didn't see it, but. <clears throat> yeah. We had our pavement marking work from last year, which we closed out. Um, it turns out that they, that our quantities were basically three short of what they actually did. Uh, so they painted some additional symbols. So that cost is, is reasonable. Um, so it was $255 they, was the extra. <clears throat> and that's sent to who? who uh, is that, that is contractor? LL Pelling, their painting division Pelling. does the okay. uh, marking. So I don't know if you need to just get approval. Yeah, I think we'll vote for that one specifically. So does everyone understand that from his report about uh, we need to pay for the three additional markings? I think everybody read that. Okay, so is there any objection to paying LL Pelling for the three additional markings at $255? Hearing, um, hearing no objection, uh, that bill will be paid by unanimous consent. And I'll make sure Lori knows that too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple other things I was gonna touch on the report. Um, uh, Metronet is finishing up their work in town. We did have some issues with uh, getting them to follow the correct procedures and the walkthroughs and stuff a couple weeks ago, but I, I think that's all worked out. Um, they're expected to probably start that work, I would assume after the snow melts here and finish up their work in town. Now that's so, the last section, right? That north, or did, did, didn't did I read yep. you had one more section? No, that was the last one, okay. That's the last I was one. Confused. Okay, Correct. very good. I don't think I could take another section. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they were working on golf you today. Okay. Oh, good. Thanks, Mike. Um, so that should be done shortly, Mike. Um, they only had a week or 10 days remaining. I guess as I hear myself say that out loud, <clears throat> they're gonna have restoration work to follow up with in the spring for a lot of these areas. So obviously we can't have them fix up turf and stuff right now. Um, so they're finishing up their, their work to install this infrastructure for their fiber network for, for the city. We will, we will be having follow up with them on restoration. Uh, once the weather gets better. So just realized that was probably more accurate. Thanks for adding that. Citizens were concerned <laughs> about that too. Thank you. Yep. Uh, a couple other things. We submitted the, the federal funding application that we talked about last month um, for the sunset and, and Melrose maintenance work. Um, I think that's on the agenda for the MPO to discuss next week um, and go through scoring and, and recommendations to the board. Louise, if I remember correctly, that's that board meeting to finalize that is at the end of the month? Yes, it's that Wednesday. So the TAC meeting is the 21st. So the next week, I think, would that, what would that make it? The 29th. 29th. It's the yeah. 29th at okay. 3 30, 4 o'clock, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So I don't have anything to report on the, on the status of it at the moment, but. I, I do know there were five projects submitted. It's um, at 4.30 at Johnson County second floor conference room. I just, okay. I did write it down. There you go. Anybody can join me if they'd like. I'll, uh, it's very right. interesting. It's, it's uh, elected uh, officials. Uh, Tim, Tim represented the city one time. So he, he understands it somewhat. There you go. 
So that'll be coming up uh, this month. I can tell you there were five projects submitted and the MPO scored each of them. And uh, the University Heights project was scored, I think thir third, third place out of five. Um, but of course, the amount of funding everybody requested in total as well over what's available. So that'll have to be um, 16 million and we have 9.3 available. Yeah, correct. Yep. <laughs> that is just roughly. Yeah. So uh, the the University of Iowa <clears throat> think buying development project again, same same as past months, no no update, no information. Uh, Melrose complete streets. Uh, Ryan and I have started preliminary design work, laying out how this thing is going to fit, but we have not yet got into uh, nailing down acquisition easement locations yet. Orn Elementary is doing an addition, which I think everybody's aware of. That's supposed to start this summer. Uh, it'll last most of the through the next summer. Um, We've reviewed that. And uh, the only thing we have left, I know that Terry Gert would be issuing the building permit for that. Um, we would be issuing the, the grading permit, the CSR permit, construction site runoff. Um, that's part of your citywide DNR permit. Anytime you have a development in your city of an acre or more, um, you're mm -hmm. obligated to review that site and permit it uh, to make sure the grading and the runoff and keeping sediment out of the waterways um, portion of that is done correctly. So uh, that, that'll that be our next involvement with that project. Uh, I, uh, I don't know if Chief, if you had talked about this, but uh, some of the traffic signal work that we talked about last month uh, has been completed at both Sunset and uh, Kosher. Yes, both of them have been completed and I forwarded invoices uh, from Jim for payment. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Any questions for Yeah, I, Josiah? I do. Uh, yes. Josiah, this is Doug. Did you uh, get my email regarding that panel on Monroe Street that's heaved up four inches? Um. It's in front of 306 Monroe Street. Don't Monroe know that I did. Stern. Yeah, no, the, I sent it to you about a week or two ago. I didn't get a response from you. That's why I was curious if you never got it. Maybe I need to forward it to you. But what was the that, address? 306 Monroe. And apparently hey, they're Doug, saying I'll... the panel is heaved up about four inches and and uh, they want to know what we could be doing for it because it's a danger to pedestrians and damage to vehicles. Doug, I'll look for that here uh, after okay. this and uh, give you a call or head out there and take a look at it. It should have been around the March 6th timeline. Anytime I get it, I usually immediately handle it. Sometimes you copy me. I, I, I didn't see it either. I don't know if you copied me or not. But anyway, that's fine if you didn't. Okay. Th thank you, Doug. I'll, I'll take a look here. Okay, and when is when you. is uh, Russ going to patch, do some patchy? I know it's probably a little early right now, but it, it's coming up, right? Yeah. We usually do it. We usually do one in the fall as late as we can before the weather turns bad. And then it's kind of, uh, he's kind of hopscotching around the weather because it's got to be dry. Um, so I don't, I don't have a date, but. <laughs> Good luck with that. Uh, uh, coming uh, west of Sunset on Highland to Monroe Street and the top of Monroe, there's quite a few things that need to be filled in there. He's filled them in the past, and I'm just, you'll probably see it on your way to 306 Monroe. Highland Drive near, near Monroe intersection. Yes. Yes, you know, it's on the. Okay, yeah, I know. I know he's been there before. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanted to point that area out. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks so much, Josiah. And I really appreciate all the work with uh, 
met, you know, working with Metronet, you and Ryan were doing that. And I, uh, both Doug and I got multiple calls from people and uh, that's all resolved now. So that's good. And I appreciate yep. all your work on that. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, so I'll go down to building zoning and sanitation. Tim, do you have anything? Nothing month? to report. Thank you. And e-government, uh, Lisa, you sent around a written report. I did. Uh, did you want to comment on a few of the dates sure, for the council? Put them in the announcements, I suppose. Spring leave vacuum in April 17th. City cleanup day is April 29th. And we'll have some highlights with instructions on the website so that we don't have the same issues we had with the fall leaf vacuuming that was so delayed because of the yard waste that got mixed in. And cleanup day will say all the things that can't be put in the landfill. So that'll be on the website soon. Any questions for Lisa? Thank you, Lisa. Um, are there any announcements anyone wanted to make? Um, is there any objection to adjournment? Hearing none, the meeting's adjourned by unanimous consent. And I wanna say one more time, go Hawks. <laughs> <laughs>